Diego, good to get you back. It's it's been a while since you and I chatted. You've been on Real Vision a few times. Um, I think maybe just to start, just introduce people um, to what you do um, and kind of how you look at the world because I think it's a really interesting time. And you know, you've been coming on Real Vision over the years. You built your thesis, and now it's all playing out. So let's let's go through a bit of that first bit of background. Well, thanks for having me back. It's it's uh, it's been over five years, I think, since the first appearance and uh, early days of Real Vision. Um, so uh, my background is is I'm an engineer. I'm a mining and petroleum engineer, uh, originally from Spain. I did my my thesis in uh, mineral economics and specialized in in real options, and that uh, really changed my my life changed my career. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to to start in uh, in investment banking in London in the mid late nineties. Um, I was trading FX and precious metals with uh, with JP Morgan, and then I was with Goldman and Merrill, where I was eventually uh, leading uh, globally the business uh, on the commodity side. I was in London. Uh, I spent some time in New York and Singapore, uh, where uh, I spent a lot of time with uh, with Grant and. Um, and then I moved on to the buy side with, with my own firm, uh, also uh, with some large macro players uh, like uh, Bluecrest or, or Diamond, um, before I eventually made it back home to, to Spain, to, to uh, where I'm managing partner for Quadrig Asset Managers. And uh, what got us together, I guess, it was it was my my third capacity. So not just being on the buy side and sell side, it's, it's been my, my capacity as a um, uh, as a book author, as a, so as you know, I have two books. The first one was uh, called "The Energy World Is Flat," which I co-authored with uh, our good common friend uh, Daniel Lacalle, and that at the time was putting forward a very uh, contrarian thesis uh, to the prevailing consensus of the market: 120 dollar oil, 200 peak oil theory. And I'm a, I'm a contrarian by by nature. Uh, I look at forces, I look at equilibriums, and there were a number of relationships and, and beliefs and misconceptions that they were just bound to break. And uh, and so the flattening of the energy world as a thesis not only survived; it's actually been been reinforced with yeah, the passage a, of time. It was a brilliant call. It was what it was a book that I read. It changed my mind immediately. I kind of like, yeah, I get it now, and <laughs> it's been dead right. And I think it will remain so for a long time. Yeah, I think the, you, you analyze the forces. It's, it's not just about. It's, it's more about the framework and how these forces interact, and and that makes it. I mean, it was it was a fascinating process just writing it. And as I always say, you think you know it until you try to put it in writing, and then you realize maybe you didn't know it that well. And I certainly learned uh, a lot through the process, and and that uh, led to to the second book called the uh, the anti bubbles. Uh, where once again, I guess I put forward uh, what at the time was a very contrarian thesis, uh, challenging this idea of monitoring fiscal without limits and and and, and what had to give. And uh, the subtitle at the time, you know, Lehman Squared, opportunities heading into Lehman Squared and Gold's Perfect Storm. Uh, yeah, I think both books ironically started out. If you went to the airport, you could find them in the science fiction uh, department, <laughs> and then. Uh, through time, they made their way to current affairs, and and some of them are going to go into into history because, uh, as you said, I think this this is this is just uh, a big uh, game of chess. You know, you, some of us might be a little bit ahead of understanding these dynamics or or challenging or, or or trying to assess them, and and yeah, you see how the pieces are moving and how you know uh, this this developments either reinforce or. Or uh, or not uh, the thesis, and you need to stay very humble and, and very flexible. And and yeah, we here we are in a historical moment uh, with unexpected events, but nevertheless they're part of the game. So talk, talk us through when you sat down to write the book. What was in your mind? You were looking forward, thinking, look, there's some probabilities of of some certain factors that you thought were going to create a lot of problems. Do you want to talk us through the thesis and then let's bring us up to date with where we are now? So on the on the anti-bubbles, um, what really got me totally shocked, and this is the first line of the book, was negative interest rates. I felt that, to be honest, until that point, we were flirting with the limits of monetary policy, but within the boundaries of what was considered to be you know, fair game or the existing rules. Uh, so if you're talking about zero interest rates and printing a lot of money and buying government bonds, 
yeah, it's it's questionable, but it was certainly within the, the boundaries of the game. To me, negative nominal uh, uh, rates were just a complete uh, change in the rules of the game. It had uh, a number of implications, and, and that's what really got me you know, very worried, very much thinking about, okay, is it as simple as this? Are there limits? You know, can they just continue to do this? And, and, and how is this all going to end? And as you start looking through a lot of those implications, of course, the minute you have assets that are discounting future cash flows, <laughs> you know, the PV of a cash flow in the, in the year 2200 is, is greater than the next year's. It's just like, what are we talking about, right? So this whole nonsense would clearly have an impact in, in asset valuations. And, and I remember there were lots of things that were very early days. You, you, you know, uh, remember well uh, Larry Summers' uh, article in the FT where he was talking about, it was called the prudent imprudence of fiscal expansions. And I read it like five times and I was like, what the hell is happening here? I mean, the, 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 he was basically talking about, look, look, once upon a time, you know, we had a world where, yeah, the, we had prudence, we had the budgets, you know, the Maastricht was based on, on 60%. And, and it, but this is, this is history because this was a world of five interest rate, five percent interest rates. At zero ne- rates or negative rates, we can afford a lot more debt. And I was like, "Look, you're building the house through the roof. This is complete uh, uh, nonsense. And ha- what am I missing?" And and uh, and so as you think through this, you and you start scratching, you realize, you know, effectively one of of my favorite lines on, on the book is is the way I would summarize the previous decade. Uh, which is effectively the transformation of risk-free interest into interest-free risk. And this is really, in, in one sentence, what happened throughout the last 10 years. We went through a big crisis. You know, once upon a time, we had 10-year bonds paying you 5% nominal yields. And before you know it, 30-year bonds are paying you negative nominal yields. This transformation from risk-free interest, where, yeah, we were legitimately earning 5% per annum with no risk. And yeah. by the way... That 10-year bond at 5% in the event of a crisis, as yields went to zero, would make you 50%, which meant that the whole construct of the industry of a 60-40 balanced portfolio was based on this set of rules. What you've seen is the transformation of this risk-free. I mean, most people, I don't even know if they're still in the textbooks. I mean, they were there when I, when I did went through this. But it was a pretty fundamental basic, basic part of, of, uh, of how you value things. And then you go now to a world where basically that risk free is being totally distorted to a level that goes beyond any reasonable uh, explanation with negative yields. And, and that's just in nominal terms, <laughs> not even talking about real, where the thing is just is, is very deep. And this is deeply troubling. And, and, and this transformation of, of risk free interest into interest free risk is done nothing other than uh, delaying. Uh, the problem. It hasn't solved the problems. It has kicked the can down the road, so it's delayed the problems. What is it the has... problem? The problem is debt, I guess, right? The problem is is debt. I would say that is a dependence on debt, but uh, the problem, if we start going farther back, I guess it's this, uh, you could you could go and start pulling the, th- the, the, the thread and, and, and how far can we go, but is this, I would almost go to this reluctant, uh, this this belief I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of our biggest bubbles are, are built on, on, on beliefs uh, where the emperor had no clothes. And one of the biggest ones is this idea that you can actually solve problems with monetary policy um, and fiscal. So the biggest misconception around is you can actually print your way out of problem. You can actually borrow your way out of a problem. And the debt problem only comes after artificially low interest rates. You would never have the problem of debt, whether it's a government level or any other, if we had interest rates pricing reality. So it actually, you start going back and you see lots of things that happen. You know, every single crisis is, is, is dealt as such. Hey, we have emergency measures. Let's take some extreme uh, measures that are meant to be temporary and exceptional, only to be permanent and totally standard down the road. So I think monetary policy is at the core of, and, and the system was doomed to fail from day one, because you are effectively given this, uh, the, the printing press and the ability to distort uh, 
the value of money, the value of the time value of money, and as a result, anything that is cash flow related that requires some sort of discounting is distorted by bringing interest rates artificially low and having the ability to print that money. The left pocket lends the right pocket, so the Federal Reserve can lend to the U.S. government. And you are in that situation where once upon a time we had independence of central banks. You know, uh, Voltaire wisely said, you know, paper money eventually it converges to its intrinsic value, to, to paper. And, and he said it wisely a long time ago because they knew perfectly well that the system only would work under certain uh, rules. And and yeah, we go back and, and, and we know where it all takes us to. But I think this is all this domino effect of short-term measures where we are trying to to uh, get out of the problem in this with this short-term mindset. You know, politicians are there for the next four years, if lucky, uh, and and nobody wants things to fail in their in their face. So by this, you know, desperate uh, and, and over conviction, over confidence on monetary policy, you slowly create a process that is meant to be domestic, uh, like the U.S. QE 2008 uh, response has been widely acknowledged as a big success. That's true if you're in the U.S. <laughs> if you're in Europe, you saw. Euro dollar going to 150, and how your monetary orthodoxy basically put you as a ma- at a massive disadvantage, not only versus the U.S. but also versus China, whose currency was pegged. So the 2012 crisis is nothing more than effectively a side effect of the 2008 being transferred through currency wars and others, and that shows you why you know monetary policy is, is a contagious and relative game. I mean, the only reason we have zero, we have negative interest rates in Europe does not fool ourselves, is the Fed was at zero. And Draghi walked in. He had to do whatever it takes to save the euro. He had to effectively try to devalue. And, 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 and you know, we would have never, ever, ever had negative interest rates in Europe if the Fed had been at 2%. Never. Okay. So this is a relative contagious game that is sold as a domestic, but there's a big <laughs> a we're in global a, balance. Now we're in a really fucked up world where everybody's at zero. Mm. Barring India, South Africa, and a few others, you know, basically the entire developed world's at zero rates. So, how does so, anybody manage anything without just going more and more extreme? Doesn't it? Doesn't that kind of delta of the extremity get even sharper? You know, absolutely. It's it's subject. There's several dimensions to this. One is clearly the law of diminishing returns. Yeah. So even even if at, at a domestic level, think about how far those $700 billion of money printed got us in QE1, right? It was a pretty simple process. We, you sat the banks around the table and you said, look, we have a systemic issue. Hey, Mr. Goldman, how big is your problem? Mr. City, Mr. Merrill, whatever. Collectively, if I remember correctly, it was $600 billion and they said, done, let's print $700 billion. And people were outraged at the time, but it was much needed to print that money to avoid something else. But QE2... So I would argue QE1 was needed. QE2 was questionable. QE3 was a massive mistake. And Mm. QE3, if you remember, was actually called QE infinity. They no longer could just do QE. They had to say, we will do whatever it takes, infinite amounts. And the market didn't blink. It was already at the point where you need to do huge amount of printing to get very small uh, benefits. And when you do this, as you said, in a, in, a inter, in a multidimensional where everybody's doing the same thing, then it becomes even worse and it explains things like negative interest rates in that desperate effort to devalue your currency artificially to impact uh, you know, current account versus uh, capital account balances and things like that. And, and at the end of the day, this is all a fallacy because we are not really uh, solving any of those problems that we started with, whatever they were, and they accumulate in the system, we are delaying them. We are certainly trying to transfer them through currency wars. We are certainly transforming them into things like inflation. And this is obviously the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, areas of focus for us and, and what the next decade will be about, and ultimately enlarging those problems. And this comes in multiple forms, you know, whether it's inequality or bubbles or, or you know, uh, stagflation or many other things that, unfortunately, is, it, it seems to be the unavoidable path that we're taking. One of the things I've been looking at is within this whole equation is the Federal Reserve and the central banks kind of understood a liquidity crisis. 
but we're probably in a solvency crisis because once you get to a certain level of debt and then we've got this extended period of slow growth, well, there's no way of generating the revenues that you need to pay off the debt. And you kind of feel like, okay, how do central banks solve a solvency crisis? Well, the only way is to put it on the government balance sheet and then back onto the Federal Reserve. This becomes much more problematic, I think. Well, they've actually gone further. I mean, the once again, when you think about the Federal Reserve uh, just printing money to lend it to the government, who in turn will either spend it in in some ways that that was that's that's fine. We knew that they've actually gone way farther because now they're actually act buying um, high yield or even equities in some parts of the world. So the money printing, and I think it's very interesting, you know, if you think about the recent crisis, you know, where we had, uh, you know, effectively things exploding in every dimension. We had an energy crisis, we had the airlines, we had the consumers, the producers, we had everything, the unemployment. The, 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 the debate, what the U.S. is doing is the Fed is, is figured out, they said, look, I have all this unemployment, uh, either, you know, I, I'm going to have to pay for this one way or another, okay? So the airlines blow up, that means there are layoffs, I'm going to have to pay for uh, benefits, I have less income, and you know what, instead of just closing that circle, because I know the movie, I'll just print the money up front, give it to these guys and hope that those jobs are, are maintained. And by basically going that way, what I've been really, one of the things that has been blowing my mind, and this is just a reinforcement of, of the thesis, is what are the limits? What stops the Fed from just, you know, in the oil market, you remember when oil prices were negative, and the idea was, look, let's just print money and buy oil. We just buy it of, of all the guys. And then it was like, well, what do we do? Like, well, you can just, uh, we'll have to physically store it somewhere. And someone had this brilliant idea, and I don't think it was ever implemented, but it shows you the, this, this mindset of we'll just buy it off the ground from the producers. And you are like, you don't even have, so at that point, you realize that they will print, they just feel like they can print infinite amount of money and buy anything they want, effectively, in any form, right, whether it's uh, government bonds or oil in the ground or bankrupt airlines. And the question is, what are the checks and balances? What, what's stopping this process? How is it really as simple as this? And, and what you see, in a way, is there are a couple of things that go. I mean, one is, you know, if you are holding dollars as a, as a reserve currency, you were doing it in the hope that you wouldn't get an Argentina or a Zimbabwe or a whatever. You say there's some, uh, you know, process, there's some control. But once the Fed blatantly tells you, I will do whatever it takes just to prevent this thing from imploding, you know, two things will happen. One is the currency goes. So this is why the dollar has been under so much pressure. Um, and, and the second is inflation. And, and inflation is coming, I think this is perhaps the, 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 the most misunderstood part of the, the equation because uh, people, we, we can look at, I, I have this debate all the time, and people go, yeah, go, come on, you're talking about inflation, but look at all the deflationary forces in the system, right? We have unemployment, we have uh, demand destruction, we have this overcapacity, we have technology, of course, we have demographics, we have all these de deflationary forces kicking in the system. How How... In the world, can you be talking about inflation being a problem? And what we need to understand is that inflation is 100% a monetary phenomenon. Okay, it's not about the value of your house going up. It's not about the price of bread going up. It's about the value of the money that you use to buy your house and bread going down. And once that clicks in your brain and you understand that effectively we are filling that deflationary gap, which is huge. Okay, and the central banks are fooling everybody by saying multiple things. The first one that inflation is just one number. Look, your inflation basket is different from mine. It's different from right. every single one in this. So don't fool yourself by inflation is 1.2. Do go to the supermarket, and you'll realize what what is. So the inflation that is, that's not a real number. It's it's very different, and it's already happening, right? And you have this situation where the bigger the deflationary gap, the more room we're giving central banks to print even more money. And they're doing it in a way where now the U.S. is even blatantly walking away from the 2% target 
talking about a symmetrical target. <laughs> it's like it's okay to overshoot on the upside, and it's written. I mean, it's 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 written in the wall. It's 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 for everybody to 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 see what's coming, and I think this is really the way I would summarize the next decade: is the transformation of bubbles. Because let's not fool ourselves. All we did with artificial low interest rates and this insane amount of of uh, desperate search for yield and lending and whatever is create bubbles without precedence. And this is the new enemy. The bubbles are the new enemy. There's a change in the rules of the game where effectively central banks are no longer fighting inflation. They're fighting bubbles. And in order to prevent those bubbles from imploding, they'll do whatever it takes. And that is the new degree of freedom. So I think the next decade is the transformation of bubbles that are too big to fail into inflation. And this is something that we're starting to see, uh, in my view, and, and that will accelerate. What does that inflation look like? Because again, when inflation is a, is, a, is a different beast in many ways, right? You know, for example, I always look at a basket of 27 currencies versus gold, and gold goes up. It shows that the basket of currencies is going down against gold. And that's one way of showing it. But you don't feel it necessarily because wages aren't going up and stuff like that. There's because of this monetary devaluing, yeah. which I think is is the important thing for people to get their heads around. Um, so I don't know. I mean, how do you how are you thinking this inflation is going to show itself? The first point to understand is is I'll just emphasize the point I made earlier: is inflation is about the value of money going down. Yeah. Now you can think about that in multiple dimensions. I mean, many, many higher equities are just a way of of inflation. Okay, the, the, you can think obviously about the most obvious one, which is real assets. I mean, it, it's about the balance of which the speed at which you're printing money, uh, currency A versus currency B versus real asset C. Okay, in the case of gold, there is an element of printing because producers do go out, and I think the number, the magic number is, I can't remember, 1.6% per annum, right? Yeah. So theoretically, if central banks were printing on that sort of pace, the amount of dollars and the amount of gold would equal. But the problem is when this uh, gets tipped off. So inflation has multiple uh, uh, dimensions, but it's really as simple as that, is the loss of value in, in, that, in that money. And, and yeah, that's why you know, the, the view that I carry and the thesis that I carry is, it has massive implications for asset allocation. Clearly, you know, in that team, as I call it, you want to have your strikers, your midfielders, and your and your goalkeepers at, at all times. But your strikers should be equities, not credit. I mean, if in 20 years' time, uh, the 20, the 100 euros or 100 dollars that your your corporate bond are going to give you back are not going to buy you much at all. Okay, those 100 euros that you're going to get are not going to buy you much. So if you want a striker, somebody that will do well in in, in when the when the world does does well, you want your equity. Risk because yeah, perhaps the pi the price of wheat goes up, perhaps the price of bread goes up, but the margin of the baker and the multiplier applied to that margin will still be there, right? So the equity I think will participate a lot more than the than the credit, and that's just a way to that one of the basic yeah. implications that I see in the portfolio. But there are multiple multiple ways in which it will impact our lives. So one of the things show. I was looking at, I was writing Global Macro Investor over the weekend. And I was using the G4 um, central bank balance sheet um, and then looking at different denominators. So when you look at it in equity terms, equities have actually done a pretty good job at offsetting the printing. That's right. um, now, with this recent printing, it looks like it's breaking down. Gold did a pretty good job, but it was slow off the mark. And yeah. then it's done, it's done very well. So you can definitely see it with certain assets. The one that did extremely well in this was Bitcoin. It seemed to be the only one that actually outperformed the central bank's balance sheets over time. But yeah, I, th I think that's really important for people to understand the kind of assets you need to own. Because as you said, credit's just not going to work in this environment. No, I think the, the, the three, if, if you think about your, your football team being strikers, midfielders, and goalkeepers, I think the strikers, I would personally favor equities versus credit. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is what will work in, in a more benign environment where, you know, uh, things it's just long inflation or short inflation, basically. On the midfielder side, it's clearly real assets. By that, I mean things you can't print. 
okay and you can put whatever you want there i would favor real estate and uh and and, and gold and and or, or others but real assets in general including i mean many things and the and the the guy to avoid is cash okay lots of people i mean uh, think about putting their money in cash it's okay uh, cash is a striker in the bench you know you put your money aside you're waiting for the opportunity but if you leave your striker in the bench for three or five years you have a problem but the other area to to be mindful of is is the defenders right and on the defender side i would argue that government bonds with this sort of uh, yields already zero or negative in in many cases they have very very little defending power uh, so i i joke and i call the bond Franz Beckenbauer, right? It was once upon a time this fantastic defender, world champions in 1974, uh, but the guy is now 74 years old. So the ability for the bond to do any defending is much more limited today. So there, you need to look for the anti-bubbles. You need to look for for things like gold or or the so, so bigs does that or mean, others. Does that mean portfolio construction overall is going to have to change? Because uh, I know, 100%. I mean, you've led the way in doing that by saying, listen, we need a different sort sort of portfolio construction. But the whole industry is still 60-40, and basically the 40 is bonds, which is cash, and some of it negatively yielding. It's kind of, it doesn't cushion anything any longer. It's just cash. This is super important for investors to understand. And, and uh, you know, we've grown in this mindset of this 60-40 balanced portfolio. Uh, what you've seen with this transformation of risk-free interest into interest-free risk is you had effectively parallel bubbles built both on the fixed income and and the equities. You are discounting these cash flows at artificially low levels. You are multiplying the PEs, you know, with, with equity risk premia and all this kind of stuff. And as we discussed, the uh, government bonds, the fixed income, doesn't have that explosiveness uh, unless you think uh, interest rates will go to minus five, in which case uh, you're uh, delusional. <laughs> I just need to do a couple of numbers to understand that Germany is more likely to borrow five trillion at minus one that one trillion at minus five. Okay, already at minus one at for 30 years, you'll do your size. So there are limits to negative interest rates. The implications are huge. And, and this goes into perhaps one of the biggest risks in the system and something that we uh, emphasize a lot, which is the risk of false diversification. Okay, false diversification stands for this perception that you're diversified because look, I have a bit of fixed income, a bit of equity, a bit of credit, a bit of oil, a bit of whatever, and it looks like I'm diversified. The reality is when you have a big crisis, every single piece in the portfolio behaves the same way. It's all one trade, right? This idea, it's become very relevant. It's a byproduct of monetary and fiscal without limits. You've already yeah. squeezed the orange, creating these bubbles. And no longer you created the bubble, which means your problem is huge. Uh, you actually have no defenders, no conventional defenders. What it means, and this is really the way we shape things up, you know, with, with my fund. And, and, you know, I think it's not about decorrelation. It's not about being super smart and deciding. It's about playing your position in the pitch. And we play goalkeeper. You know, we, we are about 55% in the year with a Sortino close to five. We're the best hedge fund in the world in February, uh, plus 10%, plus 19.1 in March. And then we've been up also in the last uh, quarter. So you want to be in a situation where your strikers, you want them to be call options. You want your strikers, your equity or whatever to be, to give you that upside, but have some sort of limited downside. You want to choose your strikers to be call options. And you want your defenders and goalkeepers to be put options. You want things that will pay you a lot of money when there's a crisis, but they will protect the capital. And this is really like in football, okay? Barcelona and Real Madrid and all these teams, they don't win just because they have Messi, right? They win because they have three chances and they score two and they shoot 10 times and they only score, they receive one. And as simple as that, if your strikers do their job and your goalkeepers do their job, then magic happens because then you get into rebalancing. And this is key. So understanding the risk of false diversification understanding what are the true strikers, what are the true goalkeepers and defenders, and then having the ability to embrace the stupidity of the market, okay? I mean, things like, like the VIX, right, as a clear anti-bubble in the system. I mean, the ironic thing, and, and, and just as a reminder of, of the concept of, of anti-bubble, which I coined in the book, as you know, 
and we've discussed it in in previous uh, discuss, in previous interviews, but I think it's worth perhaps uh, revisiting. Sure. You know, when you think about when you think about bubbles, we're talking about assets that are artificially expensive, okay, and they are based on a belief that happens to be false. It happens to be a misconception. So this is Soros' view of of, of bubbles. You know, the emperor had no clothes. Mm -hmm. What uh, I looked at is I said, look. Uh, I generalized the framework of Soros and said, misconceptions distort reality. But not only through artificially high valuations, you could also have artificially low valuations. Okay? So this concept of anti-bubble means three things. The first one is assets that are grossly artificially cheap. It means it's a matter of when, not if, that they will go up. Okay? They're a form of extreme value. Okay? That's number one. The second important dimension is the fact that bubbles and anti-bubbles are like distorted mirror images of each other. They're effectively two reflections of the exact same process. It's the same misconception that is driving, could think about a medicine or any misbelief, right? Up and down uh, valuations of assets. So by construction, the moment the misconceptions understood and the bubble bursts is the exact same moment that the anti-bubble reflates by construction because it's the same process. In fact, it's often the anti-bubble that pricks the bubble, okay, as we'll see in, in a second. So this idea does give you a sense of, and this is why I called it anti-bubble, a bit like an antivirus or an anti-missile. It's a defense mechanism against the bubbles, right? And when I said anti-bubble, by the way, I, I swear I meant more of a computer virus, not, <laughs> not COVID. But, uh, but ne nevertheless, it, it still worked. And the third dimension, which is very important, and the point I was going to make, is that bubbles and anti-bubbles are sort of feeding on each other. So think about... Uh, S&P and the VIX. Okay, I would argue that uh, artificially low volatility feeds or com uh, contributes to artificially high valuations in, 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 uh, in equities, for example. And it yeah. does it both for qualitative reasons, which is complacency, the perception of low risk, as well as quantitative reasons, such as artificially low vol, creating effectively CTA leverage, you know, they, they, that auto correlates and feeds into their own trend. So effectively, what you get is a, the beauty of risk premia. Nobody wanted to buy puts in the S&P at 3,410 vol. <laughs> okay. Now, well, a few of us, uh, you, you, yourself included. But being a contrarian and effectively understanding the mirror image of this bubble equity and, and, and volatility, effectively, it works, works wonders. So the beauty is that the market is giving you the cheapest insurance when you need it the most. And that's the moment of most complacency. And so when you put everything together and you think about the, the anti-bubbles and you think about this dynamic and this portfolio construction, what we really need to do is look through, okay, what are the beliefs that are false? What are the bubbles we're building? What are the anti-bubbles? What are the rules of the game? And in that sense, we don't claim to have a crystal ball. You know, all oh, equities will collapse or whatever. No, all you know is something has to give. I mean, look at this, this month, right? We have a very dire outlook with COVID worsening in many parts of the world, earnings, whatever, you know, lots of issues. Equities up 5.6%. And, uh, and, and, you, and you look at the other side and you see that it's all driven by, by government bond yields. I mean, it's, 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 it's the only reason it's all about the risk premia. It's all about this equity valuation is largely about, you know, this distorted value of money. So all you know is that, you know, if you build a portfolio that has, you know, bubbles and anti-bubbles, you're going to be much more balanced because you are effectively building something that is going to behave in a given way by construction rather than relying on asset class diversification, which is completely gone. But one of the issues is with this, when people start to, and we'll go into, the, into how you construct some of this, but generally speaking, people think of this as like a long vol structure. Most of those long vol structures bleed cash. So people are out of business and then they suddenly make good, you know, in a, in a short period of time. How do you build a portfolio that doesn't do that? How, how do you get it so, it so it does okay in good times, but then really acts as the anti-bubble in, in, in bad time? How, how, how do you do that? First of all, very important considerations. And, and when, we, um, when we've built a strategy, we have pretty ambitious targets, you know, which is Capital preservation first, it's first and foremost. Second, you want, as a goalkeeper, you want to create very big positive returns when the clients need it, 
you know, when, when things go wrong. Yeah. Uh, and then you want to do that with neutral to positive carry and expectancy. Exactly. Now, to, to, to your point on many of the volatility funds, one of my uh, criticisms of, of some of the, uh, the use of volatility funds is that they're often you type of payoffs. So they're basically telling you, hey, if the market's down 20%, I'll make you a ton of money. If the market's up 20%, I'll make you a ton of money. And my answer, my question to them is, I'm already, your strikers are making you a ton of money when the market's up 20%. Our job as goalkeepers is to give left tail protection. It's not right tail. So in terms of, the, the problem is that if you're actually trying to catch both sides, I will catch you the minus 20, I'll catch you the plus 20, you may not catch any, plus you may be bleeding way more than you need. It's a different game. I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's different. Now, the second comment I would make is we are long options. In fact, we're not necessarily, there's, we have to differentiate between long options and long volatility, okay? Mm -hmm. This is a, a very important concept and I could give you, there's two main schools of, of thought in options trading, okay? And we, in, in my strategy, uh, you know, effectively one of the things we've done is, you know, we're long things like gold or treasuries, but we have an option portfolio. And one of the things that makes us apart, stands apart, is that we only buy options. When you buy an option and you can only buy options, there's a lot of good things that happen. The first one is with 100% certainty, you know your downside. Okay, if I spend 1% premium in an S&P put and I'm wrong, I lost my 1%. Okay, when I was global head on the commodity side, I've seen a guy with $1 million of VAR lose 50. Okay, mm. a lot of these things happen in every crisis has lots of things that uh, you could see. Uh, a lot of these blow ups, and, and, and I'm uh, elaborating with, with some of the problems with conventional defenders, is of course leverage. You know, uh, don't get me started with with uh, leverage gold miners and the JNUG and what happened in March, uh, where a good idea turned out into a terrible outcome because of leverage. Right. So today the miners are up significantly, but the leverage play is worth still a few cents on the dollar. But it's really about uh, hidden short volat also be beyond the obvious leverage. It's about hidden volatility and hidden correlations and how this, these things um, effectively uh, behave in, in, in crisis. So you could see the typical case. You know, I, I know everybody loves Tesla on this, on this channel. So you could say, uh, look, Tesla is a terrible asset. I'm going to buy puts on Tesla and I'm going to finance those puts by selling calls. And my point to them as a risk manager is, dude, you're not financing anything. Your long puts, your short calls, and if you did it on a leverage basis and this thing just went up, you are out. So yeah. this is, if you just bought your puts on Tesla and you were wrong, okay, I lost my premium. But if you naively were caught into financing those positions effectively within a leverage basis, you're, you're bankrupt. So it's very important to understand what, not to do and how not to blow up. And these are very well-known recipes such as no leverage, you know, hidden volatility, hidden correlation and things like, like uh, artificial bar. So what we do is first and foremost, we only buy options. You might argue, wow, that's very restrictive. How much are you bleeding? And then I would give you again, a, an example. There are two big schools of trading in, in options. What I would call the Black and Scholes boys and girls and the Monte Carlo boys and girls. OK, let's think about how these two options operate. So the Monte Carlo boys and girls think about options and the premium represents effectively the trade off between time value, your, your theta and gamma, how much you make uh, by uh, playing the uh, delta neutral position. Right. It's about implied versus realized volatility. Mm -hmm. It's about the path dependency of the payoff. So I could give you a very simple example. OK, so you buy puts on the S&P for one month, you spend whatever, one percent. And then you as a Black and Scholes person, you know, you tell me, Diego, uh, I want you to trade the S&P vol. Uh, and let's say that, uh, well, uh, you're telling me you, I want you to trade the vol. I don't want you to be directional. <laughs> so it's like, OK, fine, I'll delta hedge it. So I have my put, I delta hedge it. And let's assume for the sake of argument that the market goes down one percent 
every day for the next one month. Okay, you as a as a Monte Carlo, sorry, as a Black and Scholes guy, you know, market goes down. You have a bit of gamma. You buy a little bit of the market and you buy, buy, buy. After a few days, there's probably not a lot of gamma left. You did not have a single chance in the entire month to sell back the gamma that you bought. The realized volatility of a straight line is zero, and turns out that potentially you could have even, you know, flattened out or even lost money. And you're you come to me and say, Diego, the S&P is down 25% in the month. You're a, a, a vol guy. And the reality is, well, I bought it at X percent implied. It realized zero. Yes, I had some gamma. But it's possible that I even lost money. Now, this is the Black and Scholes world. It's the market makers. And it's the way the market operates. It thinks of that this way. The other way to think about options is more like Monte Carlo. And this, as those who are familiar with the method, is, is Monte Carlo, the casino. So you basically look at 100,000 iterations of what the price could do based on your implied volatility and correlation and forwards and whatever. And then you look at the expected value of your option. So in this case, the put on the S&P. And surprise, surprise, magic happens. Ex ante, Black and & Scholes and Monte Carlo will give you the exact same valuation. The present value, the, the expected uh, trade-off of this theta and this gamma, it's exactly the same as the expected value of the option. But there's a big difference. If I bought that put option and I went on holiday for a month and I came back and I asked what happened in the market and the market is down 25%, you made 25 times your money. Okay. So when you think about the market as a Monte Carlo person, you think about premiums. You don't necessarily think so much about volatility. And thinking about premium is very important. You know, If you're playing long-dated FX forwards, for example, Okay, you could see such a massive interest rate differential and, and such a position that when you apply the forward to the vault, to the skew, you know, effectively, you, you have multiple ways in which you would get the same price subject to different variables. So volatility means less. And in fact, you have incredible opportunities to buy artificially cheap optionality. You could find, and what I'm going to say sounds a bit shocking to some people, even to some professional options traders, but it is perfectly possible to buy options that are cheap, the three things we look for, cheap, that have very explosive payout, 5 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, and that are actually neutral or even positive carry. Okay, Of course, it's not that obvious, you may need to look to, for certain things, and this comes sometimes in vanilla form, uh, with big uh, yeah, the F forwards. FX, FX forwards were great for a while. It's, it's a very good example, long dated things. You know, yeah. so. But then you have also uh, uh, more exotic payouts and correlation plays, and this is something that, for the sake of argument, we can we can show people. Let's think about. Uh, I'm I'm the goalkeeper, right? So my view is I want to be things that are, for example, we could bet on gold higher or S&P lower. So let's take just a case study here briefly to see what would we do. And let's take, you could do the vanilla option or we could do what is called a digital option, something very simple, black or white, heads or tails, pay yes or no, right? So let's start with, with um, gold. If you, if you have the spot price, you take your forward and if you bet market lower, higher or lower than the forward, that's roughly 50-50, that's roughly two to one. In a very low vol environment, uh, if you go a little bit farther out and you say, well, what are the odds of gold being in one year 5% or higher? Okay. Obviously, it's not 50%, it's less because the market now needs to go up. So for the sake of argument, let's say that that's three to one. Okay. So yeah, whatever. It depends on the volatility. The lower the volatility, the bigger the payout, and the higher the volatility, the farther out you need to go. Yeah, and the, and the time. Volatility and time. And time. And time. So let's say, and these are real numbers more or less, one year, 5% out, it was sort of three to one. So pick, pick. It would have worked well, whatever. Now you could do something similar on the S&P. You could say, well, S&P, higher or lower, 50-50, two to one, you know, 50 cents will pay you one dollar. If you go farther out of the money, uh, you go a little bit farther out, then obviously the skew is it put skew is, is going against you. But let's say for the sake of argument that you could also get three to one with five percent moves. So you and I could choose and say, hey Raul, would you rather buy three to one gold up five percent or three to one uh, S and P down five percent? And 
who knows? Perhaps we like one, perhaps we like the other, perhaps we like both. Now, the question for you is, how about both? How about gold up, S&P down at the same time? And here, the market needs to figure out the implied correlation. So what happens and what's driving things there? And one of the things that the market has been doing lately is there's been a lot of demand as an inflation play, and, and correctly for now, for gold higher, S&P higher. Okay, so the market is demanding and, and doing a lot of products. So I'm happy to take, let's say, the other side. I might say, look, I, I, I actually believe gold higher and, and S&P lower as, as a gold keeper. And assuming zero correlation or even things have been pricing slightly in our favor, here the two events are considered uncorrelated. So you could do that at 10 to 1, so roughly 9 to 1, but you get a little bit of a pickup. So now you're risking, let's say, $1 either lose it or to make 10. And the idea here is that perhaps some of these bets are the same bet. <laughs> a scenario where gold is flying might well be because there's trouble, you know, and even rates lower don't, don't fix it. So when you create and you find, you know, all the tools available, you know, you look at forward skews, time, implied correlations, you know, equity higher, dollar higher. I mean, we, we did things during the crisis, you know, I was accumulating this kind of stuff. You, you know who the defenders are. You know who the conventional guys are. Is, is gold higher, treasuries higher, dollar higher, VIX higher. You know who the guys are going to be under pressure. Is, is, is equities, is credit, is high yield, is commodities, commodity currencies, right? How do you use your budget of options to buy these kind of bets in the most diversified and effective way possible? So right now we are uh, about 550 million of, of uh, assets under management in the strategy. We have a lot of these small bets placed. And then you benefit from things like, you know, equities down, dollar up, right? And by buying these things are 80, 90% discount to vanilla, boom, these things could be very, very explosive. So at the end of the day- But isn't that I, a I, bloody difficult portfolio to run, right? Because you've no. got tons of implied correlation bets, probabilities, and yes, you, you, you have some sort of structural framework in your head, but it's not an easy portfolio to run because you have so many moving parts. If you were delta hedge in this, it would be impossible. <laughs> be, yeah, you can't it, do it. it. You can do it. You can do it. You would blow up. The, the beauty of this is that I only buy these options and I size these options. Okay, my average bet is 50 basis points. What time horizon is your general option structure? I have, I have one option that is 30 years, just to give you a sense. But here it's about finding the right balance between... <laughs> put some bubbles, call some anti-bubbles, finding the right uh, uh, mix of, of maturities, finding the right mix of, of underlines and stuff. So I have budgets. I have, for the balance of 2020, I have 5% at risk. That's it. With 100% certainty, you're telling me, Diego, it's, it's bloody difficult to manage. No. With 100% certainty, that 5% that in options I bought in 2020 cannot lose more than 20%. What's hard to manage about that? Nothing. So let's say you close an option, you'll just yeah. respend that risk bucket with the maximum yeah. five percent. You may you may not choose to do all of it. So let's say exactly. a gold option you have goes up and it's now it's gone up to three exactly. percent of NAV, you trim exactly. it back down to fifty basis points. So for example, VIX, okay? Fascinating trade. Okay. We talked about the VIX earlier and, and, and people are saying, Diego, come on, the VIX is is uh, mean reverting, is negative carry, it's impossible. Well, guess what? The VIX, the VIX at the end of February was breaking 40. We had it at 40, 45, 50. And the market is indeed very used to thinking that the VIX is, first of all, every single spike in the VIX was sold aggressively, right? It's some sort of mean reverting and, and stuff. The second thing the market was telling you is this is going to be very short-lived, okay? Now, you and I have been looking at the virus and many others and could realize that this is not something that's going to go quickly. This is going to be a while. Now, your front contract in the VIX was trading 45.50. May and June were trading at 27. So we're talking about, call it rough numbers, 50 in the front. And two uh, contracts out, you had 27 and 25 on a forward basis. You could buy the future at 25 for June, okay, when the spot was at 50. So you had massive backwardation on the expectation the market was going to collapse. But from a vol perspective, you had the front trading at 150, 175 vol, and you had the, the, the deferred contracts just two, three months out trading at 75 vol. So half the forward, half the vol. 
what it meant is you could buy a $40 call, which we did, <laughs> uh, with effectively positive carry because if things stayed at 40 to 50, you were long at 40 for less than $2. So you had a low premium, but that was my, my worst case scenario. If the market was to um, effectively a roll and stays at 45, 50, you would potentially make five times your money, just purely on a roll basis. And if, as it was the case, uh, in, in our view, the uh, VIX would spike higher, then you're sitting in this thing. Now, that money that we spent, I had about, in, in dollar numbers, about 3 million of premium. Um, effectively, we like to exit in stages. So you th exit in one third, you exit two thirds, you exit in full, right? So that you are, by the time you sell your one third of the position, you already paid for the entire option and more. So you're playing with sort of free money. But we averaged uh, that those uh, three million. I think they, we, that we sold out for about twenty-two million. Okay, as you said, that money. I mean, at that point, with the VIX at eighty, the opportunity in the VIX is kind it's of not there any longer. Yeah, it's not there any longer. But you look to the right and you see gold has collapsed. You see the Chinese yuan is looking very strong, and you look at certain pockets of volatility. So our, my job is to redeploy that. To, to have a portfolio of goalkeepers, these things, some of them play, some of them don't play. But when they play and you monetize them, profits become capital. Okay, And so that capital becomes, in our case, gold. It becomes treasures and becomes new options. And those new options are forward-looking. And this is where people were a bit shocked at the beginning. It's like, okay, guys, you're up 45% in the first quarter. And then April came in. We have the highest one-month move in S&P since 1987. And everybody was expecting expecting a bloodbath. We were up 1.2, and then March, uh, May comes in, and we're up five percent. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? And the answer is, look, you are playing this process, and even within the options, there are opportunities. Not every single uh, asset moves synchronously. I mean, March was a great example. We had effectively the first leg of the move of you, as you remember, was. Um, you know, volatility going up and funding currencies and funding trades. So Aussie yen vanished. It went boom. Okay, uh, dollar yen goes from 109 to 101, and the Aussie goes from 70s to 58 cents or something like crazy move, right? So that was because the rally in the yen didn't happen because necessarily people where uh, they love Japan or the currency. It's like, okay, dude, I'm, I'm funding myself in a position I have carry. I've been making all this little money and then boom, they get taken out. Now, this, the, the next move with vol and then the third week you had gold and treasuries collapsing big time, right? But then you had the VIX flying. So having the right portfolio of gold keepers truly diversified. Okay, it'd be pointless if I told you that all the 50 options or whatever I own are the same thing. <laughs> in fact, we are actually long gold and the dollar. And some of the trades that we do, and this is beauty, okay, gold up, dollar up. You know, when you think about the market and you ask- yeah, that, that, that correlation bet was a, one that I've looked at for several years, fantastically cheap because it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen. And, and, this, and these things change, but correlation is, is, is bipolar. I mean, yeah. very often it just goes. So what, what, what these options allow you to do is things like, you know, if you ask the market, like like the gold and S and P trade, right? You go and say, hey, gold higher, it gives you the odds, whatever. And you say, okay, what are the odds? What happens uh, to the euro if gold is at three thousand? And the mathematical model will say, come on, Diego, easy, euro dollar, gold at three thousand, one seventy. <laughs> okay. The the model is is wired to think that if if you know gold up, dollar down. Therefore, things gold up, euro up, or yen up, or Swiss franc, or, or whatever it is. So effectively, when you combine these pieces, and it doesn't mean it works all the time or for every single thing, or it's easy, there's a lot of science in, in, in this process. But when you play options and you have the ability and the tools like you have, I mean, uh, we've talked about this many, many times in different capacities, you have the ability to actually decompose these probabilities and understand not only single asset, but conditional probabilities, uh, what you're able to do is effectively achieve our objectives, which is reduce the premium, increase the payout multiple, and reduce the carry. Because if you think about the gold versus S&P trade, for example, that we discussed earlier, 
you know, if, if you buy uh, the, the dual digital or a worst off or whatever, if one of the legs works well, in this case, it's been gold. And let's take it to an extreme. So that trade that we bought at 10 to 1, gold goes to 3,000. That condition is met. Gold is higher now. <laughs> so what you're left is a vanilla put on the S&P, which you, you bought at one third of the prices of a vanilla. So you can see how you can actually play with carry and you can actually do things by basically creating a framework of uh, where, you know, as option specialist. I love that thought process of looking at things where there's an embedded assumption that everybody believes to be true that isn't, right? The one that I always fixate on is dollar yen. I agree. The market has a total belief that dollar yen is a risk asset that, you know, the yen goes up every time there's risk. Now, my guess is there is a set of circumstances, which may be even playing out in Japan as we speak, which is it's now got a full second wave of virus. There is huge monetary printing that probably needs to be done by Japan to save their own economy. And maybe dollar yen becomes a risk off asset. Now, that the correlation bets in that because it's so in people's heads. It's beautiful. It works really well. It works yeah, and, really well. And the funding because of the, the, the forwards as well. I mean, the three-year options on dollar yen, I mean, virtually to throw them away free, you know? First of all, I, I agree with your view. I think dollar yen is bad money. This guy's just good money. And, and I think this belief will change. And, uh, and, the, and you also have another uh, thing that I like about it, which is China, okay? I think the yuan is, China is the biggest bubble in financial history, to put it mildly. <laughs> and when that goes, it's obviously gonna go through the yuan. Yeah. That's the degree of freedom in the system. Yeah. And in, in some way, if that happens, you actually know that Japan will get a first move, but then Japan it needs to needs to devalue and compete. So I, I think it will fall for its own way. It could happen for different reasons. There could be different catalysts. But when you think about that correlation versus gold, it works beautifully. And there are ways in which we might be right or wrong, but all we know is that we buy very cheap options. That's, that's what we strive to do, okay? You buy very cheap options that are potentially very explosive and they have good carry. And this is the reason why we have a Sortino 5. What is a Sortino 5? And I think this is... Uh, the, the crowd here is quite technical, so I think yeah, we can yeah, we can okay. elevate we can elevate the dialogue a bit. Uh, wh when you think about a, a strategy and how good are you as a manager, mate? Uh, and people start looking at certain uh, things, right? The first and most obvious is absolute return. Okay, my my strategy is up thirty percent per annum. Okay, that's that's good. Okay, well done, mate. Fine. Okay. Now the second thing is how volatile are you? Okay, and this is one. Uh, slight misconception in the industry, okay? So would you rather give, I mean, invest in someone that has 20% return with 20 vol or 20% return with 10 vol? So what would be roughly an information ratio or a sharp ratio of, of one or two? And it's pretty obvious that with this information only, you would say, come on, I'll give money to the Sharp ratio two is, is higher quality return. The return per unit of volatility is higher. What's implicitly uh, in this uh, assumption, in this, this in this conclusion, is that volatility is bad. Okay, That's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm it, it assumes volatility is downside, not upside. <laughs> exactly. I'm penalizing you because you are volatile. So I don't like that. I will. I I rather not have that. There are two problems with that. The first one is there's lots of strategies that have very unstable volatility. Uh, and correlation. So you could see a tail, someone that is selling tail looks very nice, very good returns, very low vol, and then boom, they implode. And the other guy that I remember this from, I don't know if you remember him, was Raditi, Nick Raditi, right? So Raditi ran the, the quota portfolio at Soros, and he was easily the best performer at Soros. Beat Stan, beat everybody. But his vol was different. He was like an 18 vol guy. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh my God. But 18 vol for him was when he was bad, he'd lose 30%. When he was good, he'd make 300%. <laughs> exactly. So this massive skew in his volatility. So and George was like, just do whatever you want. Just keep doing it. Yeah. Because I, I figured that you won't be big enough to blow up the entire fund, 
But if you make money, we're going to make enough money. And this is the way we think. I mean, it, and, and we do it in a way that you, that, that downside volatility, downside, downside you want to you wanna cap it. You want to know how much you have. And in my case, the explosiveness comes from the options. And there you can sleep at night that your downside's there. But what you get is exactly the point that you made. It's not really about average. If, if, if the distribution was symmetrical, then average volatility would be a good proxy for risk. But many uh, distributions are not symmetrical. In some cases, like ours, we have massive skew of positive. Some people have hidden negative skew. Yeah. Uh, so you want to avoid that. But when you actually think about the correlation, exactly the point that you made, look, nobody called me to complain when we're up 16 and a half in August or 10 in Feb or 19.1 in March. Volatility in itself is not bad. Is the drawdown volatility? Is the negative volatility that's bad? But when you look at the return per unit of negative volatility, which is the the Certino, that's when you see this sort of a symmetry and where we've been scoring close to five. I mean, in football equivalent terms, uh, you've you've scored five goals for every opportunity that the other team has created, right? Uh, and like. Uh, it's very difficult to lose a match when you score five goals with, with that uh, profile. And I think this is it, what it shows you is this obsession. But is with, that Sortino stable over time? Or is it observable in these current markets, which are more volatile, even not just at headline level, but you know, within sub, whether it's subsectors or within assets? How stable is the Sortino? It's a realized number. So realized obviously, number. obviously you, you're looking at, you have to do it on a realized basis. So you say, I, I, I made 30% per annum and I did it with, you know, X percent downward volatility, uh, six, six and a half or whatever. And, and that's what gives you uh, this, this sort of Sortino. So of course, it will change through time and you might have uh, different dynamics. But in my case, you know, what the, the, the stability of that is, to what extent, where is that five coming from? <laughs> and it comes from buying uh, effectively insurance that is grossly artificially cheap, in our humble opinion. And as you said, there might be long periods of time where you bought the right thing, you bought it artificially cheap, it didn't pay out, but eventually you're still in the game and you're able to realize this. So, so it's sort of, so probabilities eventually catch up, right? And, and, uh, and, and you have to stay very, very focused on this process. So to get back to how do you stay in the game? So how you explained to me is you only have 5% of NAV at risk. So even if it, it turns to a for zero... 2000, for 2020, yeah. Yeah, for 2020. That's your option, risk. In, in the options, yes. In the options. So therefore, even if nothing happens, everything stops, you just lose the premium, you're down 5% in that part of the portfolio, and that's it. Um, Theoretically, yes, except that some options... That, that's your worst case scenario. It, it doesn't mean that that's what will happen if you stay here. If you stay here, there are certain options that might Some be positive. Carry. In your favor. So in our case, this is like, you know, uh, look, for us to lose in every single thing, you would need uh, gold to go up and gold to go down. <laughs> or Europe to go up and Europe to go down. It's like, well, maybe one of them will happen, maybe not. Because you have a diversified portfolio. So my point is, you want to live in a world where you, you, from a risk management perspective, we self-imposed the long-only option for multiple reasons. But one of them is this fallacy of finance. Okay, we want to sleep at night. We want our investors to do that, and it's it brings discipline. Trust me, because you really need to be see where you spend this uh, optionality, and then you find the right opportunities with the right premium. Sure. Uh, explosiveness and carry. I think how you're going to think about buying these options is different to how most people. Most people, you know, draw a few trend lines, have a view, and say, I think the S and P is going to 3,500 over the next three months, right? By calls, you're not looking at it that way at all, really, are you? I'm you're the goalkeeper. Okay, you you are you basically told us, look, Diego, and this is the the point I was making with some other volatility funds. Okay, um, I need you in my portfolio to do saves when things go wrong. We have a correlation of minus one to risk assets. Every single time that the S&P went down, you know, and we can look at October 2018, December, May, August, you know, every single time we made money and we made a lot of money. This is not something you achieve because you're smart or because you're clever or it's because you have a obstruction. It's portfolio or, because, or because you have a crystal ball. You do it because it's your mandate. So yeah. my mandate is protect the capital, make a lot of money in a crisis, and try 
to, to preserve, to do it with neutral to positive carry. That's the mandate. So when, you, when we think about these opportunities, we think about a certain, there are cert, certain sub, uh, suspects, usual suspects. I could, the, the first decision we need to make is, do we spend our money in buying puts on risk assets or calls on, and let's say puts on bubbles or calls on anti-bubbles? Okay, that's a level one type of uh, discussion in terms of how do we allocate this. And the reality is not my job necessarily to have a, uh, I, I can have a view on that, but the answer is I will have both. Okay, we'll have some puts and we'll have some uh, on, on S&P and we'll have some calls on gold or the VIX or the treasuries. The question is, okay, what's the tenor? What are the strikes? How do we combine them? So. Our job and the reason we perform systematically during those events is because we know, you know, what happens to S&P in a crisis. You know what happens to the VIX. Gold is more tricky, okay? Maybe surprises, maybe not. But in fact, we like that because it might be giving you a different type of hedge under different things. Going back to the discussion of bubble versus anti-bubble, it's not about ratios. It's not about numbers. It's about beliefs. If you want to find the bubble, tell me the belief. Okay, in Spain it was like el ladrillo nunca cae, right? Uh, the bricks never fall, and it's like there was this this mindset, and 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 there was very. You talk to people, it's like, oh, house prices are a bit higher. It's like people looked at you, like, and they said, Diego, el ladrillo. And in Spanish, bricks never fall, and it's like, well, until they fall in your head. I mean, yeah, that's right. Of course, of course they can fall, but it's very often this mindset that. So in that sense. You know, as a goalkeeper, uh, we know our job. It's not, and, and this is very important because when you build a team, uh, in fact, there are a bunch of people that are positioning themselves as uncorrelated slash defenders. And I'm going to pick on the CTAs as, a, as, a, as an example. Yes, they did well in 2008. That was a very different match, okay? But if you go back to the football team and you ask, hey, what position do you play, Mr. CTA? And the reality is you have someone there that is, look, when we attack, I'm <laughs> front row, all in, trying to score all the goals. So equity is up. You have a guy that is max long, probably on a levered basis, but the lowest level of uh, volatility. So he's max long. How can that max long levered position in equities be a defender? It's not. I mean, the, the, the idea is when... Uh, the, the, the other team counterattacks when volatility goes and is forced to run and defend, you're telling the guy that is trying to score the goals to run really fast, put the gloves, do the saves, and then go on. And, 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 and this is what some of the CTAs have been caught. And this is why they're getting destroyed. I mean, they were max long going into Q4 2018. The market collapses, volatility explodes, they go short, only to buy it back through the entire 2019 and go max long again, only to throw it all again and then back in. So when you think about a defender, it's not, it's, it's a point, one of the questions you were asking, it's about behavior. It's about cons portfolio construction. You don't say, I'm a defender because I did well in the previous crisis, you know, and many macro guys are poker players. I mean, I'm, I'm more of a chess player, right? I play more medium, longer term. And, and I'm not looking for the next move in gold or, you know, our investors know that we have gold, treasuries and options. Yeah, I want to talk to you a bit about that bet just as we wrap up. So yeah. I think we've got a great idea of, of how you look at options. And it's not about looking for the next move. You're looking for the cheap bets. You're creating a value portfolio of options that give you, um, you know, outsized returns if you get it right or low losses if you, if, if you don't. And you just build that bet repeatedly. Yeah. What's the rest of the portfolio? Because that's if 5% if of your risk is that. What's the 95%? We have about, so the portfolio currently, the Igneo strategy, which is a usage strategy, is about 50% in, in gold and precious metals, about 25%. Is that, in, is that straight precious metals or miners as well? We, we have the flexibility to, to, do, to, to shift, but it's yep. primarily gold. So yep. call it 70% of that piece will always be gold, but we have the ability to go into silver, platinum, palladium, miners, whatever, but it's a minor piece, okay? The, the core view is on gold. This we buy without leverage, so it's a core long position, and we tend to add puts, okay, ideally. This, the idea is to run a rolling synthetic call profile, okay, yeah. which effectively uh, gives you the known upside. If you are topish and you buy the puts as the market goes down, 
you monetize the put, buy more gold. It's a kind of a rolling synthetic gold. We run a similar piece, similar strategy in, in U.S. Treasuries for about 25% of the portfolio, which I'm going to discuss because it's very important. It touches on uh, one of the misconceptions in the in the system, and there's about 20 to 25% in options. So the 5% I mentioned was 2020. We have a bucket that is another 5-7% in 2021, 22, and we oh, buy right. options that go right. all the way to 2030. So that right. 20 to 25% on 10 to 1 options could make you 2 300%. This is why we're so explosive, right? But let's look at the treasuries for a second. They're all defenders, gold, treasuries. And uh, now our view on the treasuries bucket, again, no leverage. The neutral position would be 10 years, but we have the ability to change duration. One of the things we've done is we have a non-consensus view of zero interest rates and higher inflation, okay? And this shocks a lot of people. They say, Diego, what are you talking about? I mean, uh, look, the rules of the game say that if inflation comes in, interest rates are going to go up and bonds go down. And my point is, no, the rules of the, cha- the game have changed. Because if you hike in interest rates, it's science fiction. It's not going to happen because the whole system collapses. So you're working on the basis that you cannot hike interest rates and that inflation is the, 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 the answer to some of this exit. So, for example, we have a meaningful part of that treasury component into 30-year tips, okay? You have, you know, uh, some reasonable amount of of yield to pick up. It's tiny (laughs) relative to to where it was, but it's still 1.2% times 30 years. That's a meaningful uh, upside. And we have uh, potentially risk overshooting on the inflation side. So, you know, about half of that treasury position is in 30-year tips, uh, and then the other half is in nominal uh, treasuries between five and 30s. But we play that duration without leverage and, again, thinking of as a defender. But on the option bucket, that 30-year that I mentioned is a synthetic way of being very, very long 30-year treasuries. So we bought through through a very interesting relative value trade. You, you look to play that in option format. Everything we can do in option format, we will do in option format. If you, you don't need to take as much delta one or linear risk if you can find a way in options. So th- that's that's the idea. We have these conventional defenders, primarily gold, 50%. I mean, my book was called uh, Opportunities Heading into Lehman Square and Gold's Perfect Storm, three to 5,000 gold in the next three to five years. Uh, that article that I published in the front page of the FT, I still have that view, it's been reinforced. Uh, I think treasury yields might go to zero and you will have inflation. And I think as we discussed, gold and treasuries may not be sufficient as on their own as defenders. You need to find that asymmetry in the portfolio, which you're not going to get from the conventional defenders. And the answer is options. And ideally, it's something that is One day you'll way. realize that the answer is Bitcoin, but we'll have to get you there first. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, what I'm going to say that is- That has the it, most optionality in your terms, right? Even if it's wrong. The, the, biggest, so the, biggest, the biggest factor in, in all my analysis, uh, the, the biggest bullish reason uh, in Bitcoin is the fact that you and a couple of very smart guys are bullish. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, knowing how you think, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm a little bit more skeptical. But, but, uh, read, but, read but the, book, the Bitcoin Standard, the Safety in Amos book, Bitcoin Standard, because it, it'll talk to you because it's it basically talks about the gold standard and why Bitcoin could be perceived to be a superior version of that. And even if you don't believe it's superior, you'll understand the optionality once you read it. You're like, no, no, I, 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 and I, I think, you know, I think uh, Paul Tudor Jones' uh, newsletter was also very telling, and I love the way he thought about it, you know, talking about the, uh, the fastest horse. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 you know, and I think you guys are spot on, and, and uh, there's going to be a phase in this process where Bitcoin is going to be the fastest horse. And, 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 and we're now in a phase, and I think it's true for gold. I mean, many people are, might be telling, they're thinking right now, Diego, come on, we're at historical highs in dollars, by the way, and every other currency we made it long before. What's next? I mean, do we have retracements? Look, this is a whole new game. Gold is just a number. Okay, there are multiple ways in you, you could think about the value. And I know it sounded crazy when I was talking about 3,000 gold when it was at 1,200. Uh, but it, now I'm conservative. <laughs> now I'm, I'm almost left behind. 
once you get into certain price levels, this becomes very exponential. And I have no doubt that Bitcoin is and could be one of the most asymmetric asset classes. Um, so I, I, I defer to you for the uh, and, and very smart guys for, for the rationale. I love both Bitcoin and gold, for, for, all for the same reasons. So let's cut forward three years, right? Yeah. Let's assume we are in an accelerated phase of bad shit happening. Yeah. And the central banks are fighting as we expect them to do, doing what we imagine. Same with governments. And gold is now at three and a half thousand. What next? What, what is the next <laughs> phase of this? Because you'll have captured yeah. that phase. And in that kind of environment, you'll have done very well. But once you get to that and the system is now at the point of change, what is the next iteration? I think, you know, when... When we design these these solutions, these strategies, uh, there's a temptation to think you know certain asset classes have done their job and that's it, right? So you could think about uh, rightly so about bonds. Okay, have bonds completely lost their use or their value? Is there any value left in bonds? And the answer is well, I think they will continue to be a core allocation in part of many in many insurance and many portfolios. And there's going to be situations where perhaps there's a risk of sell-off with with inflation scares and 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 whatever happens. So, you know, it's almost like the the first phase is not easy money in any way, but certainly from very artificially low prices to more normal. And then you will have, I think, there'll still be a role to play, and and uh, and we will see what it means. And I I think here as part of the the team and the portfolio. Uh, that true diversification comes from having lines that some will be green, some lines will be red, but that's where the diversification comes. So I think from here to, to 3K, it's going to be perhaps faster uh, or could be more explosive. You have no clear references technically, and it's just a number. Uh, warning, because the drawdown is going to be brutal when it happens. So you, you might get you know the people who felt that missed out at 3,000, we will all be talking about 10,000 gold, and then you will maybe go back to 2,000 in one day. Okay, yeah. who knows? Who knows? This is what we're getting into. So if yeah. you're levered, you're dead. Yeah. Okay, dead, which means you should favor options or non-levered ways or other, other ways to play about this and do it in a, in a portfolio context. So I think, look, my, my vision uh, and, and this chess game that is being reinforced has many variables. Uh, it's going to create, I think, a very polarized uh, outcome. You know, there are some clear winners, there are some clear losers. EM is going to be brutal uh, in certain pockets, uh, certain aspects of credit. Then, depending on how bad it is and how systemic and whether they decide to bail it out, that will transfer the problem back to more inflation. If you, it's going to go, something's going to give. Okay, and I don't have a crystal ball. All I know is that. Uh, a scenario, for example, as the strategy has been doing, you know, I might be long puts on the S&P and calls on gold, but if, if both go up, you net net make money. And then if the market decides to change its mind, you get a free option. Yeah, maybe maybe you get the downside. So in that sense, I think it's important to when you think about building the portfolio, do something that is balanced and that uh, requires a thinking in terms of inflation. OK, in real terms, more than nominal. We discussed that earlier. Then you need to decide what the right weightings are. Okay, uh, I think Howard Marks, someone uh, emailed me one of his newsletters uh, and with a joke. It was like it looks like he read your book, you know, because he was he was basically talking about. He said, look, for decades, he said something on the lines the lines of for decades I've been effectively looking to optimize between uh, equity versus credit. Uh, emerging uh, developed market versus emerging market growth versus value you know all this dynamic which is really all about the strikers it's a striker mentality so it's, it's the mindset of you know uh, just uh, position your strikers and he said something look i think the next few years uh, it's the, the important balance is uh, offense and defense it's it's this is the new balance you need to to find because if you don't find the right balance between offense and defense then your strikers won't matter. <laughs> if, if you don't have a goalkeeper, then who cares whether you know your, your strikers are more on the left or the right. So I think in that sense, it's very important for people to understand their own 
risk. Many of them are strikers. Maybe many of them lost their jobs and their wealth in this crisis. So you might be a striker to start with. Then how do you want that team to work and look for true diversification? Delegate to the right people those pieces and enjoy the stupidity of the market. Enjoy the volatility with rebalancing. It's incredibly powerful. I mean, a portfolio of 80-80 Igneo S&P, you know, rebalance monthly. Just the rebalancing, just this idea that, oh, I, S&P is now 3,400, now it's 2,200, now it's back to 3,250. Uh, just going back to your neutral weight would have made an incremental 10% return. So instead of trying to pick the tops and the bottoms and fight between bulls and bears and stuff, I believe in the team. And in that team, I don't pretend to be everything for everybody, or, and I don't think it's the answer. It's you, you need to understand which position you're playing, and that's all you need to deliver to the investors. And this is, by the way, the, the number one feedback I've received from the big investors is you've done what it says in the tin. And I think this is really going back to the points we've discussed in, in, during this, this, this conversation, which is delivering on what, you know, that portfolio construction, understanding those risks of the challenges posed by the abuse of monetary and fiscal, the implications of false diversification and portfolio construction, and how we need to adapt to, to a new decade, which will be, in my view, very different from the previous one, with different challenges and different opportunities. And certainly, it's not about being bullish or bearish. It's about having the right team. You know, uh, For the American guys, it's not about uh, Michael Jordan as a bull or or, or, or single Terry as a bear. It's about having a team with both <laughs> and, and, and rebalancing them. And that way, I think it's, it's way more powerful and, and way less stressful than, than just pretending that, you know, this is about having a crystal ball because it's, it's not. Diego, fascinating. That was, I, I think a lot of people, they, there's a lot of people going to be taking notes in this, trying to figure out okay, <laughs> how the hell do I apply any of what I've learned here. But, you know, I think it really interesting. I think it's super valid what you're doing in this environment, particularly. Uh, I don't see any other way of, of of navigating it, but it's not easy. Um, so hats off to you for doing so well in a very complicated world. And having seen it, you know, again, like the energy world is flat, having seen this well in advance in a cohesive strategy that was that was kind of capturable was really good. So I, I wish you the best as ever. And I, I look forward to catching up again soon to find out more from what the hell's going on. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. I thank you so much for the opportunity to, to share the, the thoughts. It's, it's, it's been great. And I wish everybody lots of health, most importantly. Yeah. And uh, we'll be in touch. So thank you again. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Diego. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.